Beyond the Sky and the Earth by Jamie Zeppa. I'm going to start off by looking at the form and the structure. Well, it's a memoir, so it's a, it's a personal account. It's giving her perspective on her experiences. But it also gives facts, which is what you'd expect from a piece of travel writing, really. Um, you know, most pieces of travel writing don't just describe, um, they don't just give a recount of of a place that someone's been to and what they did there, but there'll be a mixture of purposes that are being met. So at times they'll be recounting, at other times describing the setting and the scene. Sometimes a writer will try to make you laugh, so the purpose will be to entertain. And at other times, of course, there'll be facts and they'll be aiming to inform you. Um, in most pieces of travel writing, you want to get some information about the place to feel as if you've learned something about it. And so Jamie Zephyr does all of those things here. So what will be quite useful is if you, you went through the text and found the moments where you think she's recounting, describing, entertaining, informing. And you could, you could talk about that when you were talking about the structure of the piece as well. She starts off by orientating you, you as a reader. So there's a sense of orientation. She's describing the physical description of the setting in the first paragraph by focusing on, on the mountains. Um, the next uh, paragraph uh, talks about her first night in Timpu and how she was feeling after the flight. Um, and then again, focuses on the mountains again. So it's very much those couple of paragraphs are very much orientating you as a reader. Um, the next paragraph, the third one, starts with the next morning. Um, that's an example of a temporal discourse marker, which just means it's a it's a word or a phrase which refers to time. So if you say something like this morning or this afternoon or later this evening or tomorrow, then they're temporal discourse markers or temporal connectives or temporal adverbials. You can call them any of those. Um, and uh, here, I think that in this paragraph where it says the next morning, um, I think she's continuing talking about the fact that she's quite exhausted and I think probably quite daunted. Um, she's struck by how different um, it is to the luxuries and the, you know, the, the kind of food and the accommodation and so on that she would have been used to in a more developed country um, like Canada. Um, and I, I think you can sense that she's quite daunted by it because at the end of that paragraph on lines 28 and 29, she's talking about these two other people that she's with, Lorna and Sasha. And then she says, they were both ecstatic about Bhutan so far, and I stay close to them, hoping to pick up some of their enthusiasm. So first of all, I think she's feeling a bit tired and a bit fed up by the fact that the breakfast didn't, wasn't quite what she wanted. Um, but she's also, I think, just a little bit daunted by the fact that she's in a really remote location, um, you know, in an alien environment. And so she's sticking close to people to, to just feel that little bit more comfort and security. I think that's probably what that's all about. Lines 30 to 53. So we're talking the next three paragraphs there. Focus on Timpu, the capital. And it describes the um, it from an architectural point of view. So there's quite a lot of architectural lexis when it talks about the, the pitched roof and the trefoil windows and the heavy beams. Um, and it describes, you know, what's in the shops, um, gives a description of some of the streets and what's down the end of one of the streets. Quite a quite impressive um, building that she describes as on line 50 as a grand whitewashed red roofed golden tipped fortress. And there's a real contrast here. You could talk about the contrast between that building and then on the other hand, the, uh, the cracked sidewalks and the faded paintwork that she mentions on line 43 or the, the quite ramshackle shop. She talks about the on line 34, she talks about the one storied shops with wooden shuttered windows that open onto the street. So there's a real contrast between these two extremes in terms of types of building. On lines 54 to 69, she then focuses on the Bhutanese people. So initially there's a, a physical description of them. Um, and then she talks about their character. Um, they then get a long paragraph beginning line 70, where she talks about the history of Bhutan um, uh, and goes back centuries um, and talks about how it started and, uh, from a, and talks about the religions and the geography and the names of the country. So it's kind of like it gives you a lot of historical insight into the country. Overall, I think the one thing I would say about this whole text is that there's a real sense of balance. 
I think she's quite honest and quite reflective about her impressions and her experiences. So at times she's talking about feeling quite daunted by the whole thing, I think. At other times she's full of admiration for the people and for the scenery. Sometimes she's talking about being quite exhausted and quite irritated by the, you know, the plasticky white bread and so on. And at other times she's really culturally curious to find out about the people and about the history and about the place. So there's a real balance in terms of the way that she presents it, some positive, some negative. OK, let's look, have a look at some of the points that you could make about language here. The first line, I think, is brilliant. It says mountains all around, climbing up to peaks, rolling into valleys again and again. And there's a kind of deliberately said it like that because I think there's a real rhythm to it. Do you know what I mean? You get these four chunks to the sentence. And I would say that the sentence structure and the rhythm seem to mirror the landscape. So the commas between the phrases and the present participles climbing, rolling, they seem to make the description roll up and down like the mountains. So I think there's a brilliant example of a sentence where the structure um, kind of mirrors and reflects what she's describing there. Another really good bit to talk about the sentence structure, I think, is on lines eight to nine, where she's talking about the long trip she's taken to get there. And she says, from Toronto to Montreal to Amsterdam to New Delhi to Calcutta to Paro. And that repetition of the two and the length of the sentence that could emphasize the length of the journey, could emphasize how tedious it was, how exhausted she is, but also I think the remoteness of the location. And on the one hand, maybe that kind of daunts her a little bit, but maybe she's also excited about it as well, because maybe she wanted to go somewhere completely out of the way. Um, look at a few more techniques and words and phrases then. I love the description on line 15 where it talks about the landscape as being a convulsion of crests and gorges and wind sharpened pinnacles. That word convulsion is an example of personification. If, you, if you, your muscles convulse, if you are uh, having a seizure, so they kind of they twitch and jerk up and down. So it's describing the landscape as if it is a person, you know, jerking and twitching and, and it's quite a violent word really, convulsion. So that's personification. There's also, there's a couple of ands in there, and I think you could call that polysyndetic coordination. So the convulsion of crests and gorges and wind sharpened pinnacles. So everywhere you look, there's a, there's a mountain and a peak and a gorge and a crest and a pinnacle. So I think that repetition of the and, um, you can call that polysyndeton or polysyndetic coordination. Um, and it kind of just highlights that there are mountains everywhere, doesn't it? There are also, I think, quite a few plosives in there. So remember, plosives are k, g, t, d, b, p sounds. And so you get crests, gorges, sharpened pinnacles. And I think those, uh, the plosives there kind of emphasize the sharpness and the, the harshness of the, the mountains. Do you know what I mean? There are these sharp peaks and pinnacles and crests. It's a rough, hard, harsh place when you get to the top of the mountains, maybe it's suggesting. Um, she also uses quite a lot of negative pre-modification at times. So for instance, when she's talking about the food in the hotel that they had for breakfast, it's instant coffee, powdered milk, plasticky white bread, flavorless red jam. So all pre-modification means is putting an adjective before a noun. And in this case, you've got lots of negative adjectives before nouns. So you could say the writer uses negative pre-modification in the phrase instant coffee or powdered milk in order to emphasize that she was less than enamored with the breakfast, okay? Line 68, she's talking about the Bhutanese people and she, she tries to sum them up. She finds it difficult because eventually she says no single word. She can't find a sing, one single word to hold all of her impressions, she says on line 68, 69. But she tries and she talks about their dignity, unselfconsciousness, good humour, grace. And these are all abstract nouns. So it means that they refer to concepts, ideas, qualities. So you could say that the writer uses the positive abstract nouns, dignity, unselfconsciousness, good humour, grace, in an attempt to uh, explain the, the, the character of the, the Bhutanese people. Um, she says it's very difficult to do that though, doesn't she, when she says, but, no, but can find no single word to hold all of my impressions. And that I think emphasises how much she seems to admire them, how impressed she is by them. She's almost in awe of something about them that she can't quite pin down. 
there are moments when she uses um, uh, Bhutanese lexis, Bhutanese words. That's all lexis means, words, vocabulary. So she uses Bhutanese lexis like go and kira when she's talking about the, the clothing for the men and the women and the zong, which is like this word for a, a fortress. And I think she uses those to make it... Um, I suppose she's informing you, again, because she wants to tell you the actual words that are used in Bhutan. She doesn't want to dumb it down for you. Um, but therefore, she needs to gloss them, which means she just she mentions, uses the word and then she explains what it is. So, for instance, on line 46, she says, a zong, and then she says, one of the fortresses that are scattered throughout the country. Or on line 58, for instance, when she says, the women wear a kira a brightly striped ankle length dress. And so every time she uses one of these words that she's aware that her reader, her audience won't be familiar with, she then explains what it is in English. And that's called glossing the word, like a glossary that you get sometimes at the bottom of a text. OK. Um, and so I think she does that partly to make herself come across as an expert. You know, she knows these Bhutanese words and she's kind of teaching you something, I think, through the passage. So what's her, her tone or her attitude in the whole thing? Well, it's a mixture of things, but to give you some examples, <clears throat> she uses humour at times. So when she's talking about the policemen doing the, the traffic signals at the, the junctions, she talks about their incomprehensible hands gestures. Um, and I think at times she's maybe mocking and ridiculing uh, some of the people and some of the things that she sees. Um, not in a really harsh way, but I think there is a sense in which she comes from a very different culture. And there's a sense in which she she uses, takes the opportunity to make fun of something that's different to her. So, you know, the, the beauty of these people probably understand perfectly well what these hand gestures mean that the policemen are doing. But to her, because it's strange, because it's alien, it's different. She looks at them and thinks, oh, <laughs> incomprehensible. Can't make sense of that at all and almost laughs at it. So there is a sense of mocking and ridiculing. Another example of that, I think, when it is when it talks about near the end of the passage about Ashley Eden, who in 1864 visited Bhutan. And it says he had his back slapped, his hair pulled and his face rubbed with wet dough. Now that I think I, I think she she mentions those things um, because I think she's wanting to to make fun of the way that the Bhutanese people treat him. So I think it, from her point of view, it seems to me, and, and I'm just reading between the lines here, that her tone is one where she's suggesting what a ridiculous thing to do to someone. If you really want to upset someone or insult someone, say something to them, physically punish them, imprison them, you know, give, give them something that's really gonna matter. But rubbing someone's face with wet dough, what a ridiculous thing to do. And I, I kind of feel that at times there are, you can read between the lines and the hidden suggestion is that she's just mocking and ridiculing them a little bit, which you could criticize her for, but I, I don't think she's doing it really blatantly, but that's my reading of it. Um, uh, there's some other examples of humour. So, for instance, there's that joke from Gordon, who's uh, kind of overseeing the project, isn't he? And on line 47 to 48, uh, he says, Timpu will look like New York to you when you come back after a year in the East. And what he's doing is he's, um, he's playing on the contrasting perspectives of those who are new to Bhutan and those who've lived there for a while. So he's saying to, to them, you, know, that you, you think this is basic. This will seem like New York to you once you've been in the East, once you've been you know, living in a hut without any shops or without any cars or whatever, well, I don't know, whatever. OK, but he's drawing a contrast between Timpu, the capital, and the places where they're probably going to be living and, and working. Um, and he's saying, you know, that you think this is simple and basic. This is modernity. This is civilization in contrast. Um, and Zeppa then returns to that joke on line 53 when she then comes back to it and says, um, Timpu will never look like New York to me, I think. And the idea of her coming back to that, you could say that that's a cohesive feature of her writing. So she's, she mentions something and then she explains her perspective on something and then brings it back to the joke that she'd mentioned earlier on. And it just links and ties back to something that she's mentioned earlier on. And when a writer does that, you can talk about them creating a sense of cohesion. 
so, so it, it's co it's a cohesive feature of her writing that she links back to something that she's mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of her attitude as a whole, I think what she's doing is she's seeking what she deems to be an authentic experience of something radically different to the developed world. So she's, to me, it seems to be that she's leaving Canada and going to teach in Bhutan, you know, maybe with very, very good motives of wanting to help people, but she's also wanting to go somewhere different, somewhere remote, somewhere that's different to Canada. And um, when she talks about the cultural infiltration on line 41, I think it's quite interesting. She's talking about these signs of the outside world, um, whether it's Western music or, or English being spoken or a Western, you know, American film poster in a bar. And she calls them signs of cultural infiltration. Now, the word infiltration kind of, to me, suggests the idea of um, uh, an enemy. You know, you, if, if you infiltrate uh, an, an enemy organization, then you're kind of going there as a spy or something undercover to to plot its downfall or to, you know, it, it's it's what uh, countries will do when they send spies. They try to infiltrate another organization. Um, and so it's kind of describing Western American European influences as being the enemy. Um, and that, to me, kind of suggests that perhaps she views that as a negative thing, um, that maybe, uh, you know, she wanted Bhutan to be completely tra traditional. Um, she didn't want to see any signs of Western presence there at all. And when she does, I think perhaps she's a little bit disappointed um, when she says there are more signs of the outside world than I had expected. OK, so that just gives you a few things that you can say. I think probably what you need is about 10 to 15 quotes from this passage that you feel confident writing about. And if you can go into the exam ready to talk about 10 to 15 examples, then you'll be ready to write about this in the exam.